Let's get started. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, today we're going to be talking over PAC's new quality assurance program that's actually, some of it's our internal program we've been running for a long time, but we're just kind of kind of open, open the doors a little bit and let you guys see what we have to do on the back end and then how we're going to help maybe protect that on the front end uh, for for the contractors and architects and acoustical engineers and installers also. Uh, plus the builders, developers, and building officials. So we're we're kind of opening the doors so everyone gets to look in and and see what um, what's important when it comes to pack products, and and why they're important. Okay, all right. So we're gonna go over PAC's new quality assurance program. If you are on our email list, which I know we've been blasting you guys recently with quite a few emails, we're gonna try and roll that back a little bit. So maybe one a week, but. Um, uh, yeah, so we uh, we sent an email out uh, kind of touching on this, uh, I think a week or two ago, and we want to introduce you everyone to the details behind this program now that we have it fully um, open and ready to go. So we're going to go over um, a quick overview of the program. We're going to talk about who it's for, like who it's aimed at, um, why it's important, and then go through some details of what it entails on the back end and the front end for, for the consumer, I guess, if you want to call it that. And um, also, how do, I how do I identify a RISC-1 clip over an alternate or a different product? So um, here's the overview. So one thing we do is we throw a sticker in every box. Actually, there's two stickers. One is tied to a RISC-1 clip. So when the clip gets installed, there's a toe tag hanging off of it. There's also another sticker that goes on the door jam. We're at a reasonable eye level that has a QR code on it that's both for registration of the project, um, ask for a few things, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, when you register the project, we'll give you a, a, through you a gift card, whether it's um, you know Home Depot, Starbucks, um, Amazon, or you know maybe even you can say, you know, I just want, I want one of those cool Yetis that Pack has, you know, whatever, however you want to do that. Um, and what that does for us is it allows us to start creating a project database. So within this database, we'll be able to, more finely track projects with RISC clips on them. It'll give us the ability to talk to the acoustical engineers that specified that, that are maybe like inquiring about whether or not the product actually made it to the job. If they don't have in their budget to do the site walks and things like that, maybe this is a way for them to verify that, that installation. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that's a quick overview of it. We'll get into the nitty gritty of each of these sectors. So the first thing I wanna cover is who it's for. So the primary person that we're going to see are going to be the drywall installer, so the, the actual installer of the product. They're probably going to be the ones that register the job because they've got the QR codes. They see the sticker, it raises a question instantly for them. Um, so that's the first person, and what that's going to do hopefully will help um, fill in the beginnings of that, of that project information. Uh, the second person that this is really designed for is the architect and the, and the acoustician. Uh, again, to help follow through on those specifications that they put into their projects. So if they specify a RISC-1 clip or an alternative, whatever that might be, if the RISC-1 clip gets registered on the job, they may call us or we may call them and thank them for that spec, but also let them know that yes, the product did get installed. Um, I know a lot of uh, VEs, if you want to call it that, on projects will remove acoustical products as, as they sometimes are deemed maybe inefficient from a mon monetary standpoint or an installation standpoint. So this just allows us to um, verify with those, with that division, the architect and the acoustician, whether or not that product got installed. Also, one of the, the important things for us is alerting the building official that yes, there is a UL listed product installed in this position because we hold up the fire protective membrane, we hold up the gypsum board, and that is the part that keeps the building from, you know, going up instantly, unfortunately. Um, but uh, the gypsum board is a big part of that. And because we hold the gypsum board, we have to be listed in UL to do that. Um, and that building official can scan that same QR code. And when they get to the form, they'll be able to see all the UL fire resistant designs that that product is listed in. So it will give them the ability to have a quick reference. Um, but most importantly, it lets them know that this product, yes, it is UL listed. Yes, it has all of these, all of these certifications and, and uh, uh, testing has been conducted on the product and also the builders and developers. So one thing that, that we see that's important here for the builders and developers is that they may be assuming some, some extended liability if the contractor finds a not 
characteristic one product that doesn't have the UL listing or maybe doesn't have the acoustical testing that they needed or that the architect and the acquisition originally specified for the job, that builder could be assuming some liability for that if the, let's say the inferior product gets used and fails. You know, they're gonna, who, who's on the hook then, um, which is tough. The second thing that might happen is if the builder and developer um, you know, hires the architect and the acquisition. Obviously, they're the, his representatives. They specify a risk one clip. The contractor finds a great deal online, buys an, a non non you tested product, um, and the building official catches it. You know, halfway through the job, a quarter of the way through the job, after maybe the first building. Now they have to go out and tear all of that product out of the job and put in the right product. That leads into a lot of um, non desirable events when it comes to building and construction. So we'll dig a little more into that in a little bit. So I guess we'll get into it now. Um, why is this important? So on the left-hand side, you see what the uh, non-tested products can give you. They can give you cost overruns. They can cost you time. They can extend your liability and give you subpar performance or non-conforming performance. Um, these are all the things that these non-tested products can give you. They're all of this, these things are what a builder developer doesn't want on his job or their job. Um, on the right hand side, we have all of the things that PAC does. So we'll talk about this for just a minute here. So currently, PAC RISC ones are listed in over 190 UL fire resistant designs. <clears throat> we'll get into a, a little bit of a controversy here in a minute because I'm going to show you a sticker that says 174. Uh, it's actually over 190 now. So we've we've expanded a little bit. Um, with these, with the UL uh, classification, you are suspect to UL inspections now. And when I say suspect, every quarter you have a UL inspection. So every Three months or so, the UL inspector drops by whenever they feel like it. They get to go out into the warehouse and pull whatever product they want off of whatever shelf they want, and they run their inspection process. Now, it's based on criteria that we've given them on the front end. So we've set 20 years ago when we developed this product, we set criteria for our product. So it's obviously a very thought out process. Um, and the inspectors inspect those products. So this is another secondary inspection point that not just as a manufacturer, like I want to make a good product, I want it to be right, I want it to work correctly. But now we also have UL coming in and say, you need to make this product this way every time. Or if you don't and it fails an inspection and the failure is drastic, they may make you go pull all the product that you have from that run number. Um, and that's something as a manufacturer we prefer not to do. Uh, so we we follow the rules when we have to. Um, that's one of those scenarios where there's a lot of other things that come into that, but the most important part is that we've set the criteria. UL is going to hold us to that criteria, which again is why we get 190 UL fire resistant designs, is because we follow the criteria, we follow the rules, we we do all of the things that you're supposed to do. So that's just the UL part of that. That's just fire life and safety. Now we get into you know where the acquisitions come in play in the architect sometimes is this acoustical testing. So you can have the best acoustical product in the world without the fire life and safety. You're probably not going to get into too many projects. So the UL is important to us, but the reason we got into this division is for the acoustical uh, performance that the RISC-1 gives you. So as you know, if you've been around us, pack us pack for very long, we have hundreds of acoustical tests. When Mike came in, we created this great database that allows you to go in and search for what you want, find what you want, hopefully uh, find what you need for your job and, and get the data and, and move out. So we have, opened up again, opened up some uh, some of our knowledge so that it's not all held captive for, for ourselves. Um, so we've got this great acoustical test database and a group of testing for the RISC products. We also do uh, load testing. We do load testing for our, for our RISC ones. We know when the hat channel pulls out of the clip. We know when the clip yields and we know when the clip fails. Uh, we also know when the fastener breaks. Uh, all of the things that we shouldn't have to test, but we test the system. Again, we like to test systems. Um, so again, those knockoffs, they aren't giving you those those load tests. They don't know what it does. They just made it look like ours and said it's the same. Uh, we also run VOC testing. <clears throat> so we've also taken our product, sent it to Berkeley Analytics and had them run VOC testing for uh, California classrooms and small offices. So we've those are pass fail tests, pass with flying colors. Um, so these are all of the things that you get with a RISC product that you don't get with these uh, knockoffs. I'm, I'm, I don't have to be polite, I guess, at this point, um, with the knockoffs that that are not PAC RISC ones. So that just kind of gives you a, a highlight of what PAC does to make sure that our products are um, the highest quality possible for you and for us. So let's get into the details of the program a little bit. Um, 
So again, high vis stickers. There's a sticker toe tag to a RISC one clip, which I'll show you in a second. And there's a QR code stuck to the wall. The QR code sticker has um, has some information on it, but mainly just tells you click on here, register the job. Again, we talked about the gift cards. Um, we give one per project. I hate to say it like that, but only one per project because if we gave it for every registration, someone could could really spend some time on there making ten dollars a swing. And um, but anyhow, uh, you know, again. The gifts only for one. We, we would love everyone to register the, the drywall contractor, the GC, the architect, the, the acoustical engineer, anyone else who walks through the job site, even the building official can register the job with us. Um, we'd love to have that whole list of everyone's names. That would be fantastic for every job, but you know, we'll take what we can get for now. And again, creates a database. So we have traceability for our product, for the builders, for the architects, and for the acousticians. Here's that magic toe tag that we stick onto the RISC one clip. So you can see it has the UL logo and then below there you see it has the design number R16638. If you've ever been on UL.com and logged in and searched for R16638, you get all of the pack products, but you get the big list of all of the RISC one UL fire resistive designs that it is currently listed in. Here's what that uh, QR code takes you to. It takes you to this page, which is the form to register the project. You see all the UL designs at the top. Those are, I know, a lot of numbers and letters up there, but they all mean something. The reason we put, put these numbers up here is it's for the building official. So if they know they're looking at a wall that's a U305 wall, they can open this up. They can look there and go, yep, U305, I got it right there. Done deal. He can, he's comfortable. He, they, he, sorry, they are comfortable. They can move on to the next unit and do their, their inspection for whatever else they need to do. Um, but you see, we're not asking for a lot of information here in this program, and we'd like to know about you. Who are you? You know, what company do you work with? What's your email? What's your phone number? Um, but I also like to know if you have it, the title uh, or the name and title of the builder, GC and architect. If you have that information, that's awesome. Uh, project address. So get it close. Uh, you know, if it's, you know, South Southern California, like that's a little too broad, but me like, you know, Long Beach area, something like that would probably work. Um, and then the project name, uh, those are great for us because usually you can search them on the internet and find that the architect has published something about the project or someone has published, a developer maybe. Um, and then any project details. So we'd, you know, we'd love to know if it's a, a residential theater, a commercial theater, a condo, a multifamily mixed use type building. All of these things are great for us. So we kind of have an idea about the scope of the job maybe the UL design that's involved. Um, and, you know, again, it gives us some data that we can use internally to maybe steer ourselves down different avenues. If we see more projects leaning towards commercial, then, you know, we can help maybe develop new products or better products or better systems for that division. Also, any random comments that you have, you know, if you feel like, hey, product went easy, like, you know, I'd love to have it do this instead of that, or maybe I need a drop instead of this, you know, whatever it might be, we're more than happy to accept comments there or project comments if you have something about the job you want to talk about. And then upload the pictures. So we want to take a pic, we want you to take a picture of the RISC-1 clip with the toe tag on it installed. And obviously we'd want a cup close and then hopefully a zoomed out version so we can make we can kind of verify the install real quick and then if possible the a picture of the outside of the building or a reference picture of the construction <clears throat> so now let's get into how do i identify a RISC one clip there's a couple things first one's pretty basic it has RISC one stamped right on it you can see RISC one stamped at the bottom half of the clip there that's a trademark name so if anyone else has RISC one stamped on it let me know and we can have that removed. Um, so that's a pack. Here's what the box looks like. So on the box, you'll see, you know, obviously the packed logo. You see on the right hand side a sticker that has the run number, which is how we know which lot these products uh, are shipped out in. And so we have that traceability. Again, we talked briefly about UL. If there is something wrong, we have to be, we have to know who where that went and who it went to. And if there's a recall needed, that's how you recall it is off that number. Uh, the UL logo, which is very prescribed on how big it can be, where it can be, and what it has to be next to. And the text below that is also very prescribed by UL. So RISC-1 framing member, fire resistance classification, CUL fire resistance directory, 83 and and R16638. R16638, again, is our file number that identifies PAC and all of our products. 
You can also see on the left hand side, there's a QC sticker. So that's the quality control sticker. That's our internal quality control inspection. GG is the person who inspected it and the date is the date that it was inspected. So again, we're running through <clears throat> not only UL to have inspections, we're also doing our own internal inspections on the products, verifying um, you know, product um, uh, that's fully installed correctly, all the pieces are there, the, the correct box count is done, and taking some um, miscellaneous measurements on the product to make sure that it fits the, the pack criteria so that we aren't shipping out um, non-standard products. The other item I want to touch on is the internal ferrule length. This is some people wouldn't think this is very important, but for us it is. Um, so that ferrule is a prescribed length. Uh, it's slightly longer than the threaded section and the large section of the rubber. What it does is it sets the preload on the rubber. So when you're dealing with um, rubber rubber products, if you overload it, you reduce its resiliency. If you underload it, you give it too much freedom, and sometimes it won't work right. What we've done is we created this ferrule length to set the, the ideal preload for optimum performance, we feel. You know, we've tested it with this same ferrule since day one. Uh, it was designed specifically with purpose to set that depth. And this is something that you'll see in some of the other products. This ferrule may be a quarter inch down into the rubber. And if you're running a screw gun, you can over tighten that and affect the acoustical performance of the product. And here's what the stickers look like. Here's a sticker that hangs off the clip installed on a ceiling. It's, it's in our office here, which you kind of see the office <laughs> detail in the back on the sticker on the right. And that's uh, that's about eye level. So that's uh, easily visible when you walk into the job. You can say, oh, there's a giant yellow sticker. What am I looking at here? You see the sticker on the clip up on the ceiling and go, these must go together. What do I need to read here? And again, listed in over 174 UL fire rated assemblies. That needs to be updated. We're at 190 plus now. Um, and I think that's it. I felt like I sped up a little bit at the end. I apologize. I do have a tendency to talk fast, but um, that's the end of the presentation for now. Um, we're more than happy to open this up for any questions that anyone has. There is a poll that we put in the chat earlier asking if you'd see any counterfeits. Looks like you know 28%. So that's mine and Mike's answers is two. Uh, the other five that said no, not yet. Um, uh, again, you know, sometimes you you have the chance as you know an architect or an accusation to do project walk. Sometimes it's not in the budget. Sometimes it wasn't um, wasn't budgeted at the front end of the project. And we're hoping this will help some of those um, some of those questions get answered uh, without having to increase you know budget for the for the customer uh, through this program. Uh, the main thing that we're we're pushing for is to verify. Um, you know, the fire rated tested products are used in the projects that they're designed to be used in. And I noticed some some folks came in late. So for those of you that came in late, the uh, this is being recorded. And um, like with all of our webinars, we'll put uh, the recorded version of it up on our website and our YouTube channel um, as soon as we're able to. So you can always go back and reference it there. Um, and you know, feel free to pass that on to anybody else if there's somebody that you, you know, might be interested in just learning about the QA program. And um, yeah, and we'll hang out for a few minutes um, in case there's any questions. Um, and I think in the in the chat, Mike uh, Mike Dickerson uh, made a good point that um, you know the kind of projects that he's working on. Um, you know, probably a little different standards and things like that. So they may be less likely to uh, the kind of projects that are going to pay an acoustician to be very involved are um, mm -hmm. not going to maybe cut corners quite as much. Um, yeah. So that Venn diagram, maybe not quite as much overlap, but for, <laughs> uh, but you know, for the architects and contractors and things like that, that are working on a, you know, a number of projects that don't include acousticians, but maybe some acoustical products still. Um, might be more likely to see these kinds of things. And I think I just saw Mike just said. Um, yeah, they, yeah, they offer a post walkthrough. Yeah, yeah, offer a post install walkthrough, but most of the time they don't want want to pay for it. And yeah, that was my experience as a as a consultant as well. There was a lot of times that, um, yeah, we would try and you know put construction admin in our budgets, including site walks. 
but a lot of times we didn't we weren't able to get that um and, and i wonder if that's if that's changing um i know that i think it's minneapolis is now requiring like pre-occupancy sort of post-construction acoustical testing for multifamily units um and so i would imagine that those kinds of things are going to increase the number of projects that have acquisitions come walk the sites to make sure that you do pass those those tests and don't have to do remedial work um so and i think if more cities and you know locales start adopting that maybe we'll see more site visits for acquisitions it's interesting to me that a lot of the time the uh, the walkthroughs there are certain clients who are high end who go through and actually have us go do walkthroughs but there are just some that just want to be as cheap as one as can be and so they don't have us do it but we have two or three clients that just uh, insist on me doing a walkthrough and do yeah. testing that's great and testing yeah that's that's good. Do you see, are there like certain types of projects where you get more follow up and things like in my experience, if I was doing a government job, a lot of times there is a requirement for sort of post construction testing um, for, you know, federal courthouses and I did Social Security administration buildings like do you have project categories where you get more on site time. Uh, typically, uh, all the government facilities require that you do post process testing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the the ones that I'm we've seen lately are are when they're doing uh, multi-story condo buildings, maybe five or six or seven stories, and and they, we've been working with them for a couple of years, and they want they're they're now wanting to put in floor ceiling assemblies and want to have uh, all kinds of different things. Then they want to have a verification that the uh, the architectural and the acoustical performance is met by what they've installed. And so it, it does just the contractors as well as our work verifies that we actually did what we said we could do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also the one uh, the one case where the we have people who um, want to have hotels and stuff like that. They, they're always wanting to have at least two or three floors uh, tested uh, afterwards. So uh, always like the Marriott's we do or the Hilton's, they always have a scum test post. Okay, is that has that been the case on those kinds of projects for you for many years, or is that changing? Are you seeing more of that more recently? Where we see it changing is in California, it was always the case. Uh, yeah. In Arizona and in other states, uh, it never used to be quite the case. Right now in Texas, we're seeing more of it. Right now, when we go to work in Texas, we really? see a, a lot more. They want to come have us come test, which was a surprise to us. Yeah, <laughs> me, yeah. me too. I grew up in Texas, Texas and uh, <laughs> it tends to be a little more loosey-goosey with things like that. But um well maybe it's all the californians moving to texas who knows um but it's it seems to be in my experience that yeah there's more focus on acoustics and more people are paying attention to it for you know for whatever reason um which is good good to see um i see a question from kevin certificates of attendance um showing credit hours so um just for the record for everyone this uh presentation and typically our webinar presentations like this are not like registered through aia officially for credit um if you want to self-report um we do have i think we can issue just like uh, an attendance thing um so that you can submit that to whatever entity you you go to for your you know continuing education credits and stuff like that um so we're happy to do that if you want to just send us an an email um i think mike had the contact slide um or you can just yeah, send it, it to at the end like yeah back up. um if you want to send us an email just say hey I, I need this and like if you want it for aia if you want your aia number in there or something like that um you know just however you want us to put your name in there those kinds of things that's it's always helpful but we also have a log of the chat too so we'll see your name in there yeah there's the just e info at pack-intl.com yeah you want to shoot an email over there we can get that figured out for you we do have other um 
programs that to do offer full CEs. And um, I think some of those can be self paced. Uh, we do some of it through AEC daily um, or Steve or Mike can can give your firm a presentation if that's something you'd like to do. Yeah, so the one through AEC daily, there's a self paced that I think counts for like one and a half credits mm -hmm. uh, through AIA. Um, and that one's, you know, a general overview of acoustics, noise control, all of those different kinds of things. Um, we also have a live um, webinar, uh, better design through a deeper understanding of acoustic ratings, where I do a deep dive into SDC and IIC and HIIC and LIIC, um, the whole alphabet soup of airborne and impact sound isolation metrics. Um, and I've been doing that one for a while. There's recordings of it on the on the website. Um, you can't get credit, uh, official credit, by just going and watching one of those. You got to do it live, um, but we can always set those up. And um, we also offer those quarterly just, you know, as a webinar through PAC. And then I just got approval for another one on fire and acoustics. Um, and I am still working on finalizing the PowerPoint presentation for that. But um, if anybody's interested in that, um, feel free to reach out and book a time for that. And that'll force me to finish the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so yeah, that one's on sort of managing the intersection between fire and acoustics to make sure that you can meet both of those uh, you know, stipulations and requirements on a project. And it looks like Steve has got uh, links to those in the uh, in the chat there. All right. Well, Great. thanks for joining us, Mike. Thanks for your uh, Mike Dickerson. Thanks for your input. Yeah. Um, always good to always good to see you and get your input. And uh, thanks everybody else for joining us.